Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning. And I am zooming in from the basement of our own home assembly. Um, and as soon as we're done here, I'll go upstairs and preach for our assembly. So it's a double duty this morning. So I'm very grateful to be with you. Um, this morning, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the cross, uh, not so much as Mike has talked about, but I'd like to talk about the cross from a medical perspective for a few minutes. And I want to stay, I want to set this stage well. Um, uh, some of you know that I have, uh, I'm a practicing physician, and over the years, um, I took a little time to, to look at this crucifixion from a forensic look. Um, if, if that word is unfamiliar, you would maybe think of it like um, uh, something like a crime scene investigation, you know. And so you want, uh, we're going to look at that just for a brief few moments uh, this morning. And then we're going to circle back uh, from that perspective and see the, the, um, the uh, focus that we ought to have concerning the cross. So I just want to warn you, I have taken great care to make sure these um, slides are uh, palatable. And for those of us in the medical field, um, they're kind of toned down for us. But uh, uh, I, I want you to to just enter in with me as if we were to do a crime scene investigation as we look at the cross. Now, I will need to share my screen with you. And so let me do so now. Um, this one here. All right. And let's see. Do you see that? There we go. All right, forensic look at the cross, and I want to begin by looking at some of the passages. Most of these you won't need to turn to. I have them PowerPointed, but some at the end we'll turn to. Um, the, the scripture says that, um, oops, that's not the one I want. Oh, yes, the scripture says that he began to begin, or he began to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when he did so, he began to sweat great drops of blood. Now, it's a very interesting phenomenon. That is a, a difficult thing to do, actually. Uh, and so I've put up here a cross section of the um, uh, a cross section of the skin, and you'll notice that at the bottom of the screen it says hair follicle. And right underneath that hair, or right underneath that sack of the hair follicle, you'll see that sort of tangled web of red. Those are called arterioles. And those have red blood cells that carry oxygen through that little passageway. And the idea is it releases its oxygen, its oxygen and then gets diffused across the membrane into the shaft or the, the bottom of the hair cell. Now, it is possible to have such uh, high blood pressure, we would say hydrostatic force, that the red blood cell could actually be extruded into um, the, uh, hair, the bulb of the hair shaft follicle. In other words, it gets forced out of the blood vessel and gets forced into the, into the hair um, chamber. With enough pressure, it could get forced up through the pore of the skin, and then it would mix with the sweat gland, which you can see to the left, that blue squiggly line makes the sweat, gets mixed together. And if you had that all over the body, you would see uh, great drops of blood. Now, the thing that should astound you is that in order to do that, you had to achieve extremely high levels of blood pressure to do that. And in order for that to happen, you had to be under a tremendous deal of duress. And yet, I think we miss that, don't we? That prior to the actual crucifixion event, where it really started with the physical metrics of analysis, you have this individual bearing um, a tremendous burden 
prior the event so that even his sweat glands would mix with blood from the hair follicles and to the naked eye, perhaps by one of the uh, uh, apostles present with him, they could see, well, that doesn't look normal. It just bespeaks of the tremendous pressure that was on him at that time. We read the Lord's, we read the Garden of Gethsemane event so quickly, and, and, and we get the sort of synopsis version from the text that he, not my will, but yours be done. But make no mistake, that was not an easy event. And it sort of foreshadows all the particulars of the cross that will occur. The cross itself was uh, designed to be a torturous event. But what the Romans decided to do was to have multiple, ep uh, multiple touch points, multiple episodes, which sort of beat the victim down, beat the, the, um, the one destined to die down physically and emotionally and, uh, and help them break. It was designed to break their will. So one of the things that was done next was uh, we have the scripture that says this. It says that they having, ha having blindfolded him, they struck him in the face. The sister passage says similar things, except they also spit on him. So notice the, the nastiness of this, uh, uh, not just the uh, spread of, of of uh, infection, but but the idea that uh, they were showing great disdain, disrespect, hatred, really. And then in Matthew, it says something, too, that they struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, I think um, our movie-making um, uh, industry has done a great disservice to us to understand what happens when the face is, is contused or bruised. And what happens is that the, because the face is full of blood vessels, uh, full of um, um, uh, tiny arterioles because of the number of muscles in the face, because of the need for facial expression, as you can see, as I present today, uh, that because of those blood vessels, the face bruises easily, the face swells easily, and the face has uh, uh, easy um, uh, predisposition for lacerations that also bleed heavily. Now, this, uh, this is an artist rendition of somebody who's been beaten. And what I want you to notice, for example, is the right eye of the patient. Notice how swollen it is. Notice of uh, the left eye that there's blood underneath the subconjunctival. You know, you see, we say like a bloody eye. Now, I've taken care of many patients like this in my time. Usually, it's, it was around two or three in the morning, and they were uh, leaving the bar, and they had a barroom fight. And what you found was that I could barely pry open the eyelid because there was so much soft tissue swelling. So our Hollywood artists would have um, people in fights, and it's as if their face wasn't even touched no lacerations, no, no bruising, just normal skin. That's the farthest from the truth. His visage was marred more than any man. You couldn't recognize his facial features. Lips were swollen, lacerations perhaps under the, under the cheek or the gum, very painful. Uh, there would be uh, a swelling of the of the cheekbone uh, uh, on the very front underneath the eye, swelling of the eyeball itself or the eyelids. You couldn't see, he had slits that he would be able to see from. And if he had um, developments of blood within the uh, uh, front of the eye, uh, uh, front of the lens itself or the iris, he would have what we call a hyphema and it would cloud his vision. So he couldn't see, he didn't have to blindfold him. He couldn't see where the blows were coming, which I might add is very frightening in and of itself. So the cross was in its preparation was, was uh, designed to, for brutality. Now we have a couple of other things to consider in our short discussion this morning. And in this passage of scripture, it says this, that in order to gratify the crowd, that, that always struck me as odd, in order to be a political maneuverer, in order to save your uh, throne, Pilate 
uh, release Barabbas to them. We'll talk about him in just a second. But notice it says that he scourged Jesus, and after that he crucified him. In Matthew, I emphasize the verbiage or the verb scourged. Now, when we talk about scourging, it's uh, many of you are familiar with this act of brutality or violence. And you would take uh, uh, what they used to call a cat of nine tails, usually multiple strands of leather, and you would tie into the leather uh, bits of metal, uh, bits of glass, of bone. And the whole idea was to take that cat of nine tails and you would stand by the head of the patient, sort of facing the patient, just maybe to his left or to his right. And then you would take that and cast that cat of nine tails across the back so that it would cross the midline. You can see that on that um, uh, image on the right of my uh, PowerPoint today. You would cast it from, say, if you were standing on the victim's right arm facing him, you would then cast it over the midline to, to, to tear tissue on the left half of the back. And the same would be from the opposite direction on the right half of the back. Now, the next photo I have comes from the movie, The Passion. So obviously it's a Hollywood rendition. I've scaled it down to only show what, what was meant to be done with these, uh, the ends of this, of this whip. And, and you can see there that they, are in, they have latched on to the flank of the uh, person playing Christ in the movie, The Passion. Now, I don't show this to you to, to of course, uh, make it uh, difficult uh, for you this morning, but I want you to see that this device was in intended to rip muscle. If you, as you sit there in your seat, you might notice that your back might be getting stiff. And those are muscles, we call them paraspinous muscles. They run from the pelvic bone all the way up to into the neck and to the base of the skull. They're thickest in the lumbar region in the low back where the cat of nine tails would be most likely to catch and rip the tissue. One of the things that I experienced in my career was a knife wound, not me personally, a patient with a knife wound to one of these paraspinous muscles of the back. And when that happened, I noticed that you, he lacerated the skin, the fat tissue underneath the skin, and then he lacerated into the muscle belly itself. And the muscle belly uh, expose the, the, we call them the myofibrils of the muscle, meaning uh, the muscle, uh, we cut it. And so the, the long strands of tissue were now sticking up and exposed to the air. That is a very, a very painful, a very painful experience to have exposed muscle belly. The myofibrils react to it and they sort of twitch and, and dance in the, in the wound. When that happens, the patient, at least in my experience, has screamed quite heavily in pain. Now, I tell you this not to uh, disgust anyone nor to, to cause any, any problems today, but, but I tell you this because this is the kind of torture that was designed for the victim of the cross. And this is the kind of torture that the Lord Jesus was facing at the cross. And what we do in this discussion is we try to quantify it and measure it and say, ah, I can understand the agony that this man was going through. But there's more. There's a lot more. There's, of course, this discussion that has to deal with the crown, the crown of thorns. The passages that reflect there, you may turn to them if you'd like, the soldiers twist a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a robe, put on him a purple robe. We'll discuss the purple robe in a moment. Sister passages say the same thing. They say they twisted a crown of thorns on his head. And here they took a reed that they had originally placed in his hand. They took it out of his hand. The reed was supposed to be a, um, 
the, the, a scepter, like a, a, a mockery of a scepter of a king. They took it out of his hand and beat the, the crown deeper into the skull or into the tissue of the scalp. Now, it's difficult to know exactly what thorns were used. There are some think that it was a, a type of bush and some maybe from the uh, limbs or, or uh, uh, of a, a locust tree, which was known, of course, to be in that area of the world. But it, it appears that the thorns would have been relatively stout yet pliable when pressurized, when put pressure on, and, and they would be um, able to penetrate deeply. Now, as you sit, most of us have about, we, have, we can feel our scalp and our skin, our hair, and then there's roughly a half an inch to an inch of tissue before you get to the bone or the cranium, the skull itself. What these thorns were designed to do, or they were designed to penetrate the scalp and pierce all the way to the bone as you drove it into the, the brow of the victim. And when that needle, that thorn, was driven all the way through the skin, the half an inch to an inch depth of tissue, it would then hit the cranium and begin to scoot along the cranium, lifting the scalp off the cranium. I had the unfortunate privilege to see this once in um, a patient who had their, their, uh, their head hit a windshield and the windshield cracked enough to, to basically cause a laceration right across the entire forehead that um, separated the scalp from the skull. I'll never forget it. It was tremendously bloody and it was tremendously horrific to see. I can only imagine how painful this was and really um, the blood loss that could have occurred from this type of traumatic wounds to the savior. No wonder we should, we should uh, no wonder it would have been a shock to those bystanders. Mm -hmm. You see, Rome's goal was to, um, uh, to make sure that if you were a person who tried to violate the laws of the Roman Empire, we were going to torture you enough so that you would never want to do it again. Any bystanders would never want to try to, try to take on Rome. The Lord Jesus did nothing to warrant this kind of treatment. He was truly an innocent victim. All of those who had uh, put him on trial, both civil authorities and religious, religious authorities, could not find anything uh, uh, that, he, that was indictable. And yet the Lord Jesus was enduring the severest of, of torture and suffering that a criminal could be given. This was just the precursor, though. It says later on that they took the Lord Jesus and they would gamble for his clothes or cast lots. And this was, of course, a prediction from Psalm 22, 18, that they, they cast lots for my clothing. Now, what you see on the right side is uh, an engraving in the stone of the ancient fortress, Antonio's fortress. Today, you access it through a uh, uh, sort of a, a little business area called the Lithostratus. You, you go down about four stories and you get to the level of Hadrian's level that is around 120 to 130 AD. And you see the cell blocks of the prison there. You see um, this engraving, you can Google it and, and it's there on the floor. It's called the game of the king and whichever person lost in the gambling moment, that guard's prisoner would be the one that would be executed next. Now, this was about a, this level of archaeology is about a hundred years or so after Christ, but I think it's easy to see how this could uh, translate over to the time of Christ to watch as he stood relatively naked in his cell as they played a game for his clothes. The son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, humiliating himself to this degree of human torture by the very creature 
by the very creatures that he made and sustained by the word of his power. Doesn't that strike you as being unusually wrong, unusually uh, obtuse, and usually uh, 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 just should not be? Yeah, it should. But yet this is how we treated the Savior. Now, there is more, and this is the actual crucifixion event. And in this, the Lord Jesus was uh, required to carry his cross. The first thing they did is after they had put that robe on him, they ripped it off. Now, remember, just like you're getting a scab on your, on your cut knee or your skinned knee, any Band-Aid you put on that gets stuck to it. And when you take that Band-Aid off, it's excruciating. Just ask any child. They hate it. And I'm very sure a lot of us adults hate it. So when they had this robe on him, it congealed to his back, all those open wounds. How many wounds you think were there? Well, think about it. Cat of nine tails, 39 times. You're talking hundreds of wounds. And yet that would have adhered to each of those. And then to rip it off, you would just open those wounds again excruciatingly painful. Then they would take him to be crucified. Now, there is an article done in the medical literature probably 100 years ago or 80 years ago. It's published in JAMA, and it uh, describes uh, some of the things I've described. And what, what that author described there was a tremendous amount of blood loss that would have occurred. So he, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, if you lose 20% of your blood volume, you're in shock. Right. So he had to maybe have, he, he was able to ambulate. He was able to carry the cross. So maybe he had only lost 10%, but yet it would have been very difficult, dehydrated, uh, low on blood volume. Then to carry this cross. Now the cross was old, gnarly wood. It wasn't the smooth stuff like it was from the lumber mill. So anything that he put on his back would jab into the wounds that he had already uh, ha already been inflicted by the scourging process. That's what the picture depicts there. It's an artist's rendition. But once they got to the hill of execution, and there are two sites that are predominantly thought of today of, of the crucifixion. One is the traditional site. It's quite commercialized and, and uh and I don't like to take my tour, my tour groups there. I like to take them to Gordon's Calvary. That was a site, ironically enough, discovered by or identified by uh, Colonel, I think it was General Gordon and Horatio Spafford while they gazed on the northern, from the northern wall to the northern side of Jerusalem, looking along the road that goes to Damascus. Now, when you get to that site, which would have been about a two to 300 yard journey, that's why he couldn't make the full distance and, and Simon the Cyrene was, um, how should we say, abducted to carry the cross. But that was profoundly effective upon him, for we find later his son was a born again believer. Nonetheless, when you get there, you lay the cross flat on the ground, which is the upper picture there. And then you would take the victim and you lay him on his back. And that means that all those wounds from the cat of nine tails would have been, had pressure on them as he laid on the wood. Of course, you would stretch out each limb in a different direction. That is the feet down and the arms side to side. And when that happens, you would then take something similar to a railroad spike not a nail that you use to build a house or not a little, a little a thumbtack. You would take a railroad spike and you would drive it in, not necessarily into the hand because the weight of the body would not support uh, or the weight of the body would tear the tissue too much. You'd have to put it into the wrist and you'd have to do the same to the ankles. That's uh, something that's anywhere between uh, a centimeter to two centimeters in diameter being driven. Now, when they have that done, they also nail into uh, the bottom of his feet, the plantar surface of his feet, a block of wood. Because what crucifixion des is designed to do is it's designed to allow you to die by suffocation. So then they take that cross with the victim nailed to it. They would then tip it upright. And then they wouldn't, it was not gently set into the hole, 
they would let it drop into the hole and the full weight of that man's body, say 200 pounds, would be thrust forward and, and he would only be held back by the spikes in his extremities. When you do that, you put your shoulders in a perfect position to have dislocations, bilateral dislocations, which are very painful. And it says in the book of Psalms that all my bones are out of joint. This was then followed by hours, sometimes law, uh, 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 all day affair where the victim would have to step up on his toes to breathe. And if you're having trouble breathing, the last thing you wanna do is to use your breath to speak. And yet this is what Jesus would do. And he would say the most astounding things. He would, he would commission the care of his mother to a, one of the apostles. He would, he would um, stand, uh, tip up on his toes, breathless. And he would say things like, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you hear it? the agony of a man who has no ability to breathe. It says that he would look down on his body in the Psalms and he could count his bones and you can. You could count your ribs as they would be pulled so taut that they, they would not be able, the, the muscles between the ribs could not contract. It was preventing muscle contraction. Oh, listen, uh, saints today, visitors, this was not a pretty moment. This was one of the moments of human history in which the violence and the atrocity done to the human frame was at its worst. We are upset today because we see ethnic cleansing and we should be upset. We see mass graves and we should be upset. But this, why doesn't this upset us anymore? We treat it as if as if it's uh, just something that is uh, so easily talked about, but it's not. And this person, Jesus Christ, was put in a position, and I would add voluntarily on his own doing, that is, he, he let it all happen to him, so that he would experience the maximum torture possible to the human frame at that known time of civilization. I'm not sure we could call it civilization. Well, after the victim was there, he would eventually uh, tire too much to breathe. Suffocation is a terrible way to die. And it came down for the close of the day. And in order to speed up the process, many times the Romans would go and they'd use a large object like a sledgehammer or club, and they would break the tibia and fibula, your lower leg, very excruciating to do. But when they came to the Lord Jesus, it says in John chapter 19, that he was already dead. So they did not break his legs. And that fulfills a, a, a prediction of the Old Testament that no bone of his would be broken. In other words, there are countless evidences of statements, excuse me, countless statements in the Old Testament that tell exactly what was going to happen to this person. And guess what they did? And the writers of the New Testament uh, simply recorded history and they, they showed how the word of God was true. This was one of the great evidences that convinced me uh, that the Bible is exactly the word of God. No one can make those predictions. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before that. Isaiah was written somewhere between six to 700 years before that. And yet to see these things happen just as uh, with the uh, precise verbiage and, and, and physiologic uh, descriptions, now that's got to be divine. No human being can do that. Now, it says that the, one of the soldiers took a spear and ran it into his side. And you can see on the picture on the right, which would be, be uh, the, perhaps the best um, trajectory, given the fact that most soldiers were right-handed. And they would run that up. It would go perhaps underneath the rib cage, piercing through the diaphragm, and at that angle would pierce into the heart. Now, it also says that blood and water immediately came out. So I'll show you this photo here. This is an artist's rendition. You can see on the left, you can see um, a sort of a, a, 
um, a glass plane uh, through the uh, through the body. And the picture on the right is as if we are looking up from the feet. And you can see the spine is on the back. You can see the heart in the middle, the right lung and the left lung. You can see the spear at the lower left corner, just to the, uh, the, the left of the words right ventricular wall. It would pierce all the way into the heart, which has the greatest uh, accumulation of blood in the body at that time. The spleen has a lot, but the heart would have a, a several chambers full of blood. Now, when blood sits still, it begins to separate. You have the red blood cell, white blood cell, we call them the cell lines. And then you have what is called the serum. Whenever you get like one of those uh, uh, um, abrasions on your knee playing a sport, say soccer or something like that, if you notice, you get kind of a clear layer of fluid on top. And when that develops, it then begins to make the scab. The blood is separating it out from the watery part of uh, the red blood cells are separating out from the watery part of the blood. That uh, at death, that happens quickly because there's no movement of the heart. So the blood stays very stationary in the chambers. And because it's not moving, the blood is not being pumped. The red blood cells settle down to gravity and the, and the serum, the serum sets, settles up on top. So when you're stabbed with a spear, you would see blood and water come out. What that indicates is that he was already dead. It verifies that conclusion of the Roman soldiers. Now, all of this is easy to describe uh, from a forensic level, from a uh, crime scene level, and, and there are more details that we could go into, but we need to, to bring it into focus. One of the things that we need to, to think about is this whole idea that it was not just the physical sufferings, that we can measure that, as our, my brother Mike Atwood said, I think last night, we have to be care we have to consider the anguish of those sufferings. And so we, we find in the Psalms in particular, as well as in some of the prophetical books, that is Isaiah, you'll find some of the statements of Jesus Christ or, uh, uh, that Jesus would have said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The separation from God, because God is holy and Jesus is being treated like a criminal, like a categorically guilty criminal. But it wasn't his crimes. They were yours and mine. And so we have this heavy hand of God's judgment upon them, upon him. And so he would say things like, well, where are you at? I'm alone. Have you ever been alone? Have you ever been so isolated? Which one of us has not felt a taste of that during the last two years of COVID? It's called isolation, right? Here, the Savior is experienced something exponentially more as he pays for our sin. It was not an easy thing to do. It says here that, that they, he says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised by, my, by, by, my peop, by the people. This is Psalm 22, verse 6. All those who see me ridicule me. Have you ever been teased mercilessly on the playground or at the workplace, disdained, looked at, despised, spit upon? This is the Lord Jesus' legacy as he pays for the sin of mankind. And he's totally run down and, and, and um, uh, hated by the people around him. He says at one point, I feel like I'm surrounded by these strong bulls of Bashan. Those are the bulls that you would use, for example, in a, in a, uh, a Spanish conquistador, you know, where you're, where you're having the run of the bulls and the bulls are, are, are designed to gore you. Well, this is how he felt. And he felt uh, totally surrounded by dogs, ravenous dogs that are, are just uh, uh, circling around the victim, waiting to attack and pounce. This is how the Savior was going through all of these things, because there was somebody's sin that needed paid for. So make no mistake, I can describe to you the forensics of the cross, but that is nothing in comparison to the spiritual forensics of the cross. Now, the story doesn't end there. 
you may know very well that the body was retrieved by Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. He was apparently a wealthy individual, and he was, uh, took the body down after, it's, uh, after it expired. And by the way, it, the Lord Jesus did it purposefully. He, he said, it is finished. He used his final breath uh, to declare in a very, it says a loud voice, so he shouted it out, it is finished. And he gave up his last breath. That's not unusual. I've seen that before. Many patients will, will wait until a moment and they'll decide their last breath. My father did that. He was in, in my home when he was dying and he waited till I got home. I got home. I greeted him. He barely looked at me and took his last breath. So it's, it's not an unusual phenomenon, but it does show direction of will. No man killed Christ. Christ laid down his life. It was voluntary. So Joseph came and he prepared the body and uh, he wrapped it in linen and he put it in a, a, a new tomb, rich man's tomb. It means it's had, it had several chambers. And so when that was done, they, uh, they put a, a, a stone in front of it to, to seal it. And, and the, the Jewish leadership had uh, the tomb sealed with the Roman seal as if to say, if anybody breaks it, you're breaking the laws of Rome and you're subject to, to their penalties. But you know, three days later, according to the Jewish measurement of time, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Now, this is a, this is a photo of, of Gordon's Calvary. And uh, uh, this tomb there is, it, uh, is, is a large tomb. It's a tomb for a family. And if you stoop down and look from the doorway, you can see an um, a area where there, you could see the foot and the head of the platform of where a body would be laid. Clearly, no one knows the exact burial site of Jesus Christ in Israel. But, you know, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because whatever burial site you think it is, he's not there. He's risen. That's what today's about, isn't it? That we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, you can say to me, my goodness, Steve, you're a medical doctor. How can you ever say that somebody rose from the dead? I think the Bible gives me enough evidence to show me that he indeed did rise. We have evidence that he was seen by so many eyewitnesses, somewhere around 530, to be precise, from the biblical record. We have evidence to show that he was risen from the dead because all the Jewish leadership had to do was show the body, and, and this sort of renegade Christianity would have been put to bed but nobody produced the body. We didn't that we never had the smoking gun appear, right? So you can't tell me that this is a fairy tale. I would tell you that Jesus rose from the dead. It was a miracle. I've been around medicine long enough to see miracles in human in the human condition. Now, I told you I was going to revisit Barabbas. And this is in closing. You see, all of these factors of the cross, all of this forensic analysis, all of the, the, the medicine that's involved in, in the, the raising from the, that, that it's outstanding to think about. It's, it's, it, it, it sort of bends your mind in a certain way. But there's a story tucked in the redemptive narrative that is almost put there to keep us from losing track. And it's the one about Barabbas. You see, Barabbas was categorically guilty. He had been in prison for murder, rebellion, and stealing. He was uh, against perhaps the Roman authorities. Maybe he was a bit of a zealot just out of control. And he was placed in prison to be the third person of, those tr of that trio who was crucified that day. So Barabbas would see that everything that happened to this man, Jesus, would have really should have happened to him. And when Jesus was scourged, that would have been perhaps where Barabbas would have been uh, scourged. Where Jesus had uh, been hit in the face, that would have been for Barabbas. 
And everything that happened to Jesus would have been Barabbas's plight, and Barabbas did not have a swollen face, did not have thrones drilled into his skull, did not have uh, the cat of nine tails plowed across his back. Barabbas was out free, walking and talking. See, that's the, that's the little vignette of what's occurring. The absolutely guilty, the absolute murderous, the absolute rebellious, the absolute uh, thief is set free. And the absolute non-guilty, the absolute innocent, the absolute blameless is in his place. You see, that's really what the story of the cross is about, isn't it? This is why we are so moved as Christians about this particular weekend. It doesn't have anything to do with some sort of, sort of magical spell. This has everything to do with the fact that someone, the Son of God, took on the form of human flesh, which I can measure, taste, seal, and see, and touch, and, and, be, and put under the scrutiny of medical analysis. Somebody, that person, took my place before a holy God who by his holiness alone is demanded to judge sin, my sin, your sin. So this is just not a holiday for me. It's not a holiday for you, is it? This is a day when I proclaim the greatness of my Savior who rose from the dead, for because it rose from the dead by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, I tell you this because some of you have come to church today just to visit. It's Easter Sunday. It's, we, we need to come. It's, we, it's something religious to do. Yeah. I'm glad you're here, but I wouldn't want you to miss the significance of this day. Crucified somewhere around Friday, raised to, raised to life on Sunday. It's not a fairy tale. It's reality. The question is, will it be reality for you? For in truth, Every one of us should be named Barabbas. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we thank you that we've had a moment to consider all of these things about the cross. And yet, what was it really for the Holy One to bear away my sin? I don't know if I'll ever know that, but I am so grateful that I've received that. Take this message today, this somewhat unorthodox way to speak of the cross, and allow it to speak to hearts and souls everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen.